Welcome to the Spinning Our Gears podcast. As a reminder, the issues, views, and opinions discussed on the podcast are those of the hosts and their guests, and do not reflect that of any department, agency, city, municipality, state, or country. All characters and individuals discussed on the podcast should be considered fictional for entertainment value. Blue Falcons, don't go getting it twisted. This show is rated explicit and listener discretion is advised. If you aren't cool with that, hit the X and find something else. We are on all major podcast and social media platforms. The best way to get a hold of us is www.spinningourgears.com. Without any further fanfare or ado, here are your hosts, Turk, Swagger, Erica, Kenyon, and this is the Spinning Our Gears podcast. Welcome back to another episode of the Spinning Our Gears podcast. I'm Turk. Today it's just me and our guest. I hope you guys are having a good time. Today we got another big show for you guys. We have John Guarnieri. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. I'm terrible with pronouncing names. I got this like stutter issue. So, uh, This is actually a fan suggestion. Uh, it turns out that a fan of his with the Spear Talk podcast reached out to us because they're a fan of ours also and said, you guys have got to get together and you've got to collaborate. So... Uh, for those that don't know, John is a former Secret Service agent and the current CEO of Spear Talk Security. Uh, his duties kind of include training as well as he's the head security of bands like Shinedown and Motley Crue and Nickelback. So he's been around the world several times and he's got the tickets and the stories to prove it. John, how you doing, man? Doing good. It's uh, appreciate the introduction. And uh, yeah, it's it's a... Every time I hear someone kind of describe or say what I've done or do, it's always kind of, as I got older, I just, I've kind of found that I try not to take stuff for granted, granted anymore. And uh, yeah, like you said, I tra- literally traveled the world doing this in the security world since 2008. So um, it's been quite a ride. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? What activities were you involved in? What led you to the Secret Service? Uh, so... Growing up, I was always into like the Cowboys and Indians. I grew up watching all the John Wayne films and then the old Batman TV show. So I've always had this inkling to kind of do like I, – I knew on paper what good versus evil was, and so I've always wanted to be on the good side of things. Um, a lot of my early readings and stuff, I was just fascinated with people like Elliot Ness and people like that. So um, I started – I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, blue-collar family. And then as I kind of kind of established myself in terms of what I wanted to do specifically, I ended up going to Norwich University, uh, which is the oldest military college in the country. The founder of West Point actually graduated from there. A little okay. trivia there. <laughs> and so I did uh, the four years of Navy ROTC. I wanted to be a submarine officer or a system warfare officer. Uh, my dad got sick initially sophomore year of... Uh, college, uh, which would have been in 2006-ish. And so my biggest fear was if I get deployed or I get shipped off somewhere when I graduate, I might not be there to help my mom and my younger sister. So I still did the ROTC stuff, still did the, the military stuff for four years. And then my friend who graduated the year prior actually got on the motorcade unit detail for the Secret Service okay. and knew my love of whether it's going to be DEA, ATF, or some other three-letter bullshit a government agency <laughs> to get a part of. And he's like, dude, you're going to do this. You're going to love it. You'll love the Secret Service. And so that process took a whole year. Background checks, polygraphs, psyche valves, fitness. Um, 
And yeah, like the the polygraph. I always when I tell the story, the polygraph actually took two days, over well over eight hours. And it was like the biggest mind turn around. It was just crazy, asking the same question thirty times and trying to trip you up. And so, have that, that being my first polygraph, I'm kind of like, good. What am I getting myself into with the government <laughs> here? And uh, but yeah, it was great. I did that for eight years. I the process of three to four months training in Glencoe, Georgia, uh, with the Department of Homeland Security. So a lot of people in my class were FBI, uh, DEA, Bureau of Prisons. Once you graduate with that subset, you go up to Beltsville, Maryland, which is specific to Secret Service, in another three to four months where everything's specific towards what the job is. Uh, rope lines, counterfeit, uh, you name it, anything you could perceive the Secret Service to do, that's what the training was, shooting, driving, all of that. So did that, uh, did that. I left the Secret Service in May, I think, of 2014. Uh, I went through a divorce the last campaign year with Mitt Romney in 2012. I was only home like 19 days that year, just on the road campaign. And uh, I got kind of burnt out from the politics of the government. Met my current CEO now in my security firm and uh, jumped ship in 2014. I've been there ever since. So it's the politics of the entertainment industry are obviously there. They're just as stupid and bad. Uh, but here, I'm my, own, I'm my own boss. And so I really answer yeah. to myself and the people I represent. So that's kind of why I enjoy it. So was it always the goal always to be federal? Or was there any aspirations yeah, of like state, county level? I mean, I have a ton of friends who are state, uh, county. And I always... I think in my head, I visualized if I didn't do the government, I could picture myself retiring as like a constable or a sheriff in like a small town. Like I love that small town vibe where everyone knows who you are, but like you, you kind of – like there's a respect thing there. I think as you get to these bigger – which I noticed, these bigger little cities and states and stuff, it's like the devalue of what law enforcement is and the defunding and the constant attacks of – like law enforcement's always in this gray area, and they have to do the right thing at all times. And the ones that don't, sure, there's a bunch of shitheads and terrible officers and stuff. But the majority of them are so good that they just get attacked and nonstop. And I was like, I, was like, I don't know if I want to deal with the mental stress of that. Yeah. I love the, the training, and I think in any active shooter situation, or, and I've certainly been involved in stuff like that, even in the, in the private sector with bomb threats and clearing venues and stuff. I love the rush of that, but at the end of the day, like how do you deal with the media and your own bosses and your own legislature, just, just stockpiling all this negative energy on top of you. And, uh, but yeah, so I, the federal, I thought was my one way to, if I could enjoy it and I loved it, I have no regrets. Um, and it led me to where I am today. So, it's uh, it'd be crazy the last couple of years. I don't know how I would feel working through the pandemic. Yeah, specifically with the whole defund movement uh, from Trump to Biden, that whole area of whatever that chaos was, um, and then just how the perception of what goes on there now. It's just like a lot of my friends there have left. A lot of my friends are some of my friends are still there. They're like they're like John. It's it's just the there's great days. No one's doesn't appreciate their job and what they have to do and what their duty consists of, but the morale, it just it fluctuates so much where it's just like, it's such an unstable mindset to go into work every day with. And we're, I mean, we are seeing that on our levels too. It, you know, I, we've kind of told our stories. We came from an area and a, a jurisdiction that was really, really bad to places that are a lot better, but there are a lot of places in, the, in between like that where it's up and down every single day. Um, you mentioned the politics. Obviously, Secret Service is working with politicians. Yes. But were, was there a lot of politics within the department also, or was it just strictly the, the people that you were yeah, serving I mean, for? Yeah, like you could probably – you've probably talked about this on other episodes about your career, but like when you deal with people that are going for promotions uh, or like – it's it's. I mean I, I could I, – I get, it gets me so fired up talking about some of these people. <laughs> But for me, I think the politics would really bug me out outside of the actual Republican, Democrat, whatever all that chaos was at the White House and Congress and all that. It was just the – you undo the scrutiny. I think, it asked, I think part of it was the, the uh, ignorance of the general public that doesn't realize you're not picking sides. 
Right. Like you're you're enforcing the constitution, the laws, regulations, whatever the rules are. That's what you're there for. I'm not there to pick sides. I'm not there to be the judge, jury, executioner. I'm there to uphold the law. And I think people have this perception where, oh my God, you worked with Obama for eight years. Like, oh, you're a. And it's like, well, hold on a second. That's not. I might not disagree with him. I might love him. I might not. But my job is, if something would happen, I would willingly take a bullet for no matter who's in the office. Joe, right. Trump, George, George Washington, Abraham. Uh, so it's like I, there's no. And as you go through that, deal with that stuff, with the media compounding everything, and then your own department that's always kind of trying to play, like the. I don't want to get into specifics of stuff, but I knew people and classmates that whole Columbia sniper scandal, where yeah. the prostitution. Sure, the some dumb stuff was done, but the the whole thing for us was like in talk of them, the military aides were involved, other departments, other. And so it's the like Secret Service took the full brunt of this, because oh they should know better and all this, and it's like well hold on a second, like yeah I agree, but there's other layers to this here that right so it's just i don't know that type of pull up politicking for me just kind of rubbed me the wrong way and i can only imagine i don't know if you have kids or not but the officers and men and women that have uh children and like great family dynamics it's like you gotta bring and siphon all that stuff at home too and yeah it's just i could only imagine i went through a divorce and so i kind of um dealt with it my own way but if i had kids involved or it's just I can only imagine the amount of stress. And I yeah. didn't want to be part of that anymore. It's crazy to hear you talk about how the media played a role because like the Secret Service is secret, you know. And yeah. you think you think we deal with it a lot more, but to hear that you guys also had that issue is it, it's kind of a mind blow. Um you said that you worked under Obama. Was was your specialty security with politicians or did you have other assignments that you were involved in? So basically, it was all depart- heads of state. Uh, and I was stationed at the White House for those seven and a half, eight years. And so anything involved with the White House, um, I got to become good friends with all the military Marine guys that yeah. do the Oval Office stuff and all the uh, Marine Ones, uh, Air Force One staff type people. Um, yeah, my day to day, and the hours changed. Uh, the shifts were all very uh, chaos. When you first get in there, like most rookies, you have the weekends, your your days off are Tuesday, Wednesdays, but then you're still getting forced into work and overtime and stuff, all this. So, yeah, but I mean, it was a very physical, grueling. And the what I love too is that they, the standards of shooting and in service training, like there was never, I never felt they did lax on that. Yeah. I've talked to some law enforcement people over the years that, uh, this is before like the whole defund the police movement where they're like, well, the training is not in the budget this quarter. Or it's just like, well, hold on a second. You want these men and women to go out there and do their job. If they don't have adequate tra- training or gear or stuff, it's like, what are we putting these? Now we're just creating more, more like just, just terrible. And so, it's, yeah. It, and it's the first thing that gets cut. Like you said, when, when the budgets get slashed, training is usually the first thing to go. And then equipment yeah. second. So yeah, but it, I love that. I love the training aspect of it. It's funny to hear you say Tuesday, Wednesday. We used to call it tweeds at my last department because it was the same thing. The rookies had Tuesday, Wednesday off. They were working evening shift or overnights. And I think when everyone thinks the Secret Service, they think Clint Eastwood and, and what they see in the movies. So to hear that, that a little bit of that, that same stuff going on there's, kind of brings back down be, to earth. There's been some hairy moments and some crazy stuff, like places I've been, like out, like near the Gaza Strip and stuff like that. Um, but... There's a lot of standing around, too. Like, there's a lot of looking at staircases, checking on the food kitchen area, a lot of walking around. Um, but like you, you're paid for what could happen. Yeah. And ultimately, what's going to happen one day or the other, whether it's your shift or not. So, um, yeah. it's. So, so now that we've gone down this road, it's not on the schedule, but uh, what were reports like for the Secret Service? <laughs> That's the um, one thing that all cops dread is reports. Yeah, see, I love writing. I've, I honestly, I love starting with like college and stuff. Like my English, uh, my my love of English and like the the classes I took. Um, and then in the military college, we'd have to fill out these shit forms, like like dude, like if you have to take leave or whatever. And I I just love the idea of like organized, uh, whatever. So when we started doing all the training, like police reports and like. Proceed like uh, chain of custody for evidence, uh, yeah. 
stuff like that, reports, crime scenes and stuff, like taking witness statements. I love that because I can work on my writing and you figure out ways to effectively do less writing but still get what I'm trying to say across without being a distraction yeah. to the – if this is going to go further along. And so, yeah, it's – there is – you cannot breathe – if you breathe wrong, someone's watching it. So it's like when someone's like, oh, we had a fence jumper – and we had to deal with this. It's like that report is so precise to what part of the fence, how high they got off the fence, how far away they got from the fence to the first fountain on the south lawn and stuff like that where it's like before the canine hit, before the spotter. And like everything is so detailed to time, location. Um, yeah, it's like any time you – God forbid you got an arrest. And with D.C., any time out there, you had all the – obviously, you know, with, like, jurisdictions. Yeah. By the White House, it's Capitol Police, uh, Maryland Police. You got Virginia Police. You got uh, White House Police, FBI Police, Park Service. It's all these people that have one part of the sidewalk and the other part of the sidewalk. It's like – it becomes like this dick swing contest where it's like, calm down, guys. We're all on the yeah. same page here. Yeah. We're all, we all bleed blue. Let's, why are we out here arguing over who's taking this arrest? Let's get this scumbag off the street. Right. But if it had been if it had been messy, it would have been who's going to clean it up and oh, who's going to be in charge of all that. Tr- yeah. Oh, who's taking this? Who's t- <laughs> correct? If it's raining out, we'll see who shows up. <laughs> who's going to stand out there with the right. umbrella? <laughs> right. So you talk about fence jumpers. Was what are some of the, um, I guess, most memorable stories you have? And obviously, you can't give a whole lot of details because of the. Um. Yeah. I mean, I just when they when they, when you hear read about the news, it's pretty straightforward. Like they don't get very far. Yeah. Um, honestly, with the way the alarms and stuff like that set up, and like the cameras and just the the, the sheer number of eyes that are fixated mm-hmm. on that v- building uh, from all different rooftops and areas, it's very hard to maliciously. This isn't going to be like uh, White House Down or Olympus Has Fallen, where fences is being ripped down and two hundred bad guys are running the, the north and south lawn or. And the same side of that, there's also not 700 Secret Service guys running out to the front lawn being gunned down by. So right. it's, it's a uh, – when they come over, they get – it's all like the ERT teams, uh, emergency response teams, basically the canine dogs. Those get – when you see those dogs, and I, I believe they're a Malibuas, mm-hmm. they are – watching them do their training where it's like jumping through w- moving cars and ripping people out of cars, it's like – Screw that. I think I'd rather be shot at the deal with that dog. And so yeah. that's a great deterrent. And I can't remember the last time they're, they're I mean, the number one, the Slahi thing. I remember when I was there, I wasn't working. People sneak in through like parties and like open gate stuff like that. Okay. Uh, but the idea of like actually jumping over the fence lot, you're not going to get very far. And if, yeah. if you get close enough, it's, it's going to end badly for you. I uh, so like I I know being a former handler I know what it's like to train twice a month right with a dog yep. I can't imagine and I've also taken a real bite by accident from a dog I can't imagine the level of training those guys go through and what it would be like to take a real bite from one of those dogs it cannot be anything enjoyable whatsoever yeah one of my friends just his dog just retired he's been doing it there uh, God since 2012 maybe yeah. and uh, yeah the training it's the in service training is. What's tough with the Secret Service, the hours are so long, and it's just because you have to cover so much. The K-9 units of Secret Service, you're doing the Naval Observatory, where the Vice President lives, the White House, and the Foreign Missions Branch, which entails all the embassies in D.C. So you have to respond to these calls, and when you're not doing that, you're on a fixed post, but the in-service training is technology's changing, mm-hmm. explosives are changing, and location, and the training involved with that. And so it's a... Uh, it's quite a cool, like, it's just fascinating to me, like, and I always get, like, super emotional when, like, the canines pass away. I mean, let alone, obviously, it's a handler, like, line of duty stuff, but when you realize, when you see, like, the dog coffins, mm-hmm. it's like, you kind of get, it's like, holy shit, like, you don't realize, they, yes, they don't, they're not humans, but the work that these dogs do, and the retention, and the training, they, they're making those decisions, too, in real yeah. time, right or yeah. wrong. And it's like, that's as, as always blown my mind with canine handlers. It's, yeah, they are your partner there with you. You talk to them more than you talk to other people because you're with them all the time. Yeah. 
Um, maybe you can't answer this question. I'm cool with that. But is the Secret Service having retention or hiring problems like local jurisdictions are right now? I I, maybe say, you don't know. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the specifics per se, but I know all my friends that we used to be in the, we're just went through it together. We laugh and just go, if going on what's happening in the world now, and whatever the politics now in the White House the last couple of years, why would you willingly put yourself right. through all that? Like, it doesn't make any sense where it's just like you're just cannon fodder. And it's like, we well, always joke with some of my game warden friends who are with that industry with conservation and trying to recruit people that it's like, what tactics are these agencies, state, federal, local, doing to entice people? Because if I'm a college kid and I spent two years watching people throw bricks and balls of piss at cops and their own departments telling their cops to abandon and become a chop zone in Seattle and take over the barracks, it's like, what protection do I have for my own people, let alone right. the bad guys? So right. it's like, how do you, I don't know, like recruiting in law enforcement now has got to be the toughest job. Forced retirements because of the vaccine requirements that turns out New York City messed up and all these lawsuits, but all these people retire. You can't replace 15, 20, 25 years of experience. That street level experience dealing with the people and crowd control and the politics of the street is you can't replace it and get that from a book. And right. you want to throw these kids out here. And then when you can't, I think the problem we're going to run into is they're going to start lowering standards, whether it's mm -hmm. physical, priors. Mm -hmm. And you can, you're obviously more in tune with this stuff now, but it's like if you're for a police captain of a small town retires, someone gets promoted, uh, new, how new people move in that couple, next couple of years? You need to hire new people. Well, who are you bringing in to make fit these quotas? Right. You're going to start overlooking prior drug charges or domestic abuse charges mm -hmm. or the fact they had negligent discharges in some other agency, but yep. hey, we need the guy who knows how to shoot a gun. It's like, what are you talking about? And, it's, and you're absolutely right. That is happening. That's what we're seeing from like the Memphis incident. That was all oh. because of looking, overlooking stuff. Right. And what I think a lot of people don't realize is so for like a local state area, if you're looking to fill a spot and that person isn't certified, you're looking at a year to a year and a half before that person is by themselves on the street. And the way that you're describing your training and everything, it could be, what, two or three years before the person yeah. is actually trained and ready to go? Yeah. So, yeah, we can't we can't keep overlooking this and we can't just brush off someone to a retirement or a firing because it's costing the taxpayer. Yeah. And at what point – it's just funny, too, it's like the same taxpayers that, oh, defund, defund, defund. Well, the minute there's a home evasion or a – aggressive protest or mob that's outside your steps, they're the first people you call. It's just like, I have a uh, good state police friend in Massachusetts who works hand to hand with the FBI, the joint terrorism. And he got called to a uh, protest during the height of the pandemic, like the Black Lives Matter, like all that chaos that was happening. And uh, he was basically, the irony of it, you have to have a permit to protest. I mean, most... Massive protests, you need a permit, but the permit requires them to have law enforcement. So he's the point of contact for an anti-cop protest. Mm -hmm. And he goes, he goes, they were nice. They were great. It's like you get talking to them. It's like they're not bad people. It's like people are just too dumb to think outside their own doorstep and be like, hey, what am I really doing here? Mm -hmm. You're just you're watching the news. You're looking at these talking points. It's like if you firmly believe this, the only action for police reform is giving them the funds to actually trade people properly. Right. It's so and I think a lot a big problem with that is especially like with algorithms now where if you start looking at something and then now your social media is pushing more yes. and more that information, if you're on one side of it whether it's democratic or republican, that's all you're going to get and that's all you're going to think is the truth. Yeah, it's so. it's at both sides. Like there's no I don't pick sides here. It's yeah. very like the Mockingbird media, where it's like you watch the news station, these talking points and these newspaper headlines, and if you line everything up, it's like they're all saying the same thing. Yeah. So I just shut it off. I mean, that's why I kind of started the podcast. I don't really watch a lot of news anyway. When I'm on the road on days off, the TV's never on the hotel room. I could care less. I'll watch my certain 80s action movies I've watched a million <laughs> times, or I'll watch podcasts. Or I, just, I want to learn something without a political slant. But... The other side of that is if you watch a Joe Rogan episode, he has a doctor on there that talks about uh, the murder vaccine and, and like the why it is bad. It's like, well, if I get something from that and I talk to him about like, well, you're just anti-vax. People are, again, I, I want to listen and view and watch stuff that I want to learn something. I might not right. agree with it, but why can't I 
Stop labeling what we're trying to do here. And it's like people listening to this episode, the first thought would be if they were just chiming, it would be like, oh, God, they're, they're Team Trump. They're, they, 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 they're, they're thin blue line. They're never going to see through the bullshit there. It's just like, well, hold on a second. You have no idea. Well, and, and we have to do this on both sides. We have to stop trying to be the loudest, and we have to start talking and start having right. a discussion. That's the only way that we're going to get to any sort of a common ground and start fixing these problems. Because there is a problem across the board on both sides when it comes to community relations. And I think that there's still a very quiet majority, but right now all you're hearing is the two very loud parties going back and forth. So Yeah, and then we're stuck in the middle trying to police everything going on. Right. Or just be citizens amongst what's going on. Yeah. So. Uh, before we jump into the security part of it, I do want to go back. You talked about those fence jumpers. When you guys interviewed them, would they give you a reason for why they're jumping that fence? Or are they just, I mean, are yeah, they Yeah, nine times out of ten, any time you'd have like a stay away or like one of those type of people that if they don't jump the fence, they could and it look like they do. And it's all like the, I know you guys do all this straight too, but like the characteristics of like an armed gunman, like clenched yeah. fist, like what they're wearing. Uh, if they're wearing a, a, a long trench coat, a winter coat in the summer, they're sweat like there's something off here. So you do these pre-stage interviews, and all it, most often than not, they had some god in their head told them that they had to talk to the POTUS. Uh, they're here to save the world. The Nostradamus told them to show up. Gotcha. It's it's a lot of mental health issues. Very rarely is there someone there that's maliciously like I'm going to kill this person. Gotcha. Yeah. But until you do the interview, until you get through this person and again, do all the paperwork and figure out what the root of this is, every threat's a serious threat. Right. It's, this, it's the same as if someone pulls a weapon. You have right. to make decisions on the, on the fly. You can't ask them why they're pulling that weapon, you know? No, I remember one of the training things we did, uh, like the simulators and stuff, mm-hmm. we do scenario-based, and this, it was kind of dark out, dimly lit. The, the, the person, and I'm a shooter, the person was probably my size, like 6'1", 6'2", Enough where I'm like, well, if I'm in a dark alley, like I don't see anything yet, I'm going to have to go hands on with this guy. I could get bloody. So, but in the video, the guy kind of reaches out of his pocket. It's like this shiny thing in his hand. I pull my gun out and shoot the guy. And so the instructor's like, okay, we reset. And then I'm going to play the video, do the thing again. Same reaction. I get a, the second time it plays again, you realize it's not a gun, but it's a, uh, like a, it's like a utensil, like a spoon type thing that's super shiny. And that part of articulating why I pulled the trigger, assuming what it could be. And it's like that type of training and that type of like dealing with that stuff on the street was always just for me just like wild. Yeah. And like I, it's, it was a good shoot because you don't know what that is. It's like I'm not here to my, – my force, my use of force and stuff, like I don't – I'm not running that risk. If it's a gum wrapper – or the, uh, the, the turned over lid of a soup can because you're homeless and just got j- yeah. carotid edges. It's like, I'm not taking the chance going with my asp or hands on. It's like, and if you use pepper spray, just go fuck yourself. <laughs> that Absolutely. training, it's like you just destroy everyone else. Like, come on. I've always said, yeah, I would take tasing 10 times over getting sprayed again. And I've oh. told rookies, if you pull that shit out, we're going to have problems. <laughs> right. Like, just, yeah. Spraying. It's like, dude, I want to, I want to shoot you. We get back to the precinct. <laughs> All right, so let's dive into the security part because this absolutely fascinates me. You go from Secret Service, and you kind of mentioned it there a little bit. You happen to run into the person who was in charge of the company, or how, how did we get from Secret yeah, Service so to security? In 2012, uh, my CEO now, the company, Chris, he was doing security for Charlie Sheen after he got fired from Two and a Half Men. Oh, okay. Um, and so he was the height of that crazy, he was the highest paid TV star at the time. Mm-hmm. And the whole, he was doing that stand up routine, like almost like a gong show. It was a circus. Yeah. And uh, I saw him in the corner. I was there with some friends, maybe my ex wife. We had friends that worked with Charlie. And so we're, I see him in the corner. I approach him, tell him who I am. And he tells me who he is. We just get talking. He goes, Hey, John, the minute you get bored or you're tired of whatever, let's stay in touch. But, I'd love to have you. We could kind of rebrand. And so I kept in touch the whole time. And then in 2012, went through my divorce. And I was like, hey, I'm going to stay on another year or so. But I'm, I'm, let's get the paperwork going. I'm going to jump ship to you. And uh, we rebranded his company at the time uh, to Silver Spear Security. And we've done that ever since 2014. 
Was that like for you? Was that a, a big leap of faith, or was it like, hey, we're going with the punches and it it's going to be it, all good? It was a lot of fear because you're going under the protection umbrella of the U.S. government. You know where you're getting paid uh, every two weeks. Uh, you know, like you, 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 if you retire in 20 years, you have your full pension and stuff like that. But it's like I, I decided at that point that I don't want to uh, live to work. I wanted to work and then live. And so like that mindset in my head where it's like, you know what? I believe in myself. I believe in what this could be. And uh, at the very early, once I jumped ship, like I was already on a major world tour with Nickelback. Like, I yeah. never did like, there is no like, I was doing arenas and stadiums with 20,000 people all around the world. So it's like the No jump, FTO period. <laughs> right. Yeah. Th- there is no, yeah, I was working all the days of the week then. But it's so it's just like, I never had that, like that weird like transition to like build up to that level, which with my background, it helped. I could just jump in there. Not a lot of people, anytime I approach people that want to get hired or do what I do, it's just like, well, some of the best people are either military or law enforcement, but some of the best people are also people that are just businessmen, that yeah. are women, that you don't necessarily have to have that. You just have the right mindset, not to punch first, understand, be a good witness, and be a personal person. And so... I always tell people, it's like, I'm fortunate because I'm able to jump ship at that level, but it, it still takes a lot of work to make, you know, once you get to that level, the, maintain, the maintenance of that and going bigger and now doing stadiums and all this other stuff where it's like, you have to put the time in to get to that level. It, obviously, there's a lot of, there is luck involved with people you know, uh, the right, meet the right people along the way, mm-hmm. but if... The only thing that's going to stop you from reaching those type of goals, if you want to go that route, is only, it's going to be you. So. so the question that I have for you, you kind of mentioned that. Like, when police officers think of these events and they think of security, mm-hmm. it's somewhere that they're familiar with, right? It's, the, it's yeah. the event center that's in their jurisdiction. It's just going to be, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to hang out, and then you know, move on. For you, it's somewhere new every time you go. How does that, how does that work out? Are you getting like, like stadium plans weeks or months in advance? I, I, I don't... I'm yeah, so completely I mean, confused there. Yeah, so and I, I won't get too specific because it just get, it'll just bore yeah. people. Uh, but the advanced process entails me six months out. We already know the dates. The other thing too, why I love this side of what I do, we know the dates a year in advance. Whereas the government, yeah. you don't know where you're going with the president in two hours. Right, that type of stuff. So there's more structure on the side of it. So I know six months out is where we're going to be. I start the process, emails, calls. I've done this enough around the globe where I can pretty much know every contact I would need in that city. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just kind of talk through what the needs are, go through your security rider, if there's a special stage, if there's movements on or off deck, what type of pyro, what type of all that type of stuff that goes into it. And as you get closer to the date up until the actual show day where you have a, a team meeting with local police, fire, MS, uh, promoters, uh, usher, leaders, uh, military, if it's a stadium or international show, uh, and just kind of talk through every scenario. Yeah. Fire, active shooter, unattended bag. Um, and unfortunately, you have a lot of stuff like the Manchester bombing with Ariana, the Las Vegas shooting, Bataclan. So there's instances where stuff has happened in recent years where you kind of Monday quarterback, hey, if this happens, how are we going to avoid mass, uh, mass casualty type events? Um, when it comes to like the stadium stuff, though, it is it definitely, as I've noticed, in some markets in Europe, obviously South America, be careful who you trust. Um, some law enforcement, if you're in South America, I don't really trust for obvious reasons. Uh, but also some military I don't trust. Like, you don't know who's who. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of great connections down there if something were to break bad. Uh, but again, I come into a city like that where... I know the people that run the embassies. Yeah. I know that person through a long-term relationship of just talking and emailing, checking on like the different reports and stuff, like how's the stuff going through. Like when I was just down through South America for like two months with Motley Crue and Def Leppard last year, like every city, was, we're talking 70, 80,000 people every city, but it's like in Argentina and Brazil and Colombia, like some of these areas are like, just forget about the cartels and what you hear in the news. It's like there's a lot of corruption, yeah. pickpockets. And so it's just kind of having like 
Those are my precincts every time I roll to a new city. The contacts I have that I've pre-established and kind of just trust the people that you've been talking with to make sure the show goes successful. I mean, no one wants a failure of any type in any event they do, whether it's a theater show, a uh, stadium show. So it's a lot so, of trust. So if you've got like L.A. and then Chicago and then New York, are you running it like a, like a football team where it's like I'm focused on this game this week or is it I'm putting it all together because I know that we're going to be hopping from L.A. to Chicago yeah, to I New mean, York? It's, yeah, it's, the only difference there is like NFL games, they play once a week. I'm doing six games a week. Yeah. So my mindset is the preparation is always a – like I kind of talked about before, like the six months out, once you get a week out, a couple days out, you start getting more specific with those venues again, mm-hmm. chiming in, text chains, WhatsApp, all that stuff. Hey, and the other thing too, once the tour starts or show starts, if there's an issue, I can relay crowd issues. Hey, if there's we've noticed uptick in dehydration happening, let's pre-stage water the barricades. Uh, I've noticed more active crowd surfing. Uh, maybe we should look into this. What's the the crowd breakdown? Man, woman, age. Uh, is there active crowds with moshing crowd surfers? If you go into like a blue collar area like Edmonton, Midwest, the big corn, big corn uh, farmers, big corn whiskey drinkers, big corn dog eaters, and the crowds tend to get more. And they're the best crowds because they're like super passionate. I just love that blue collar mentality. Mm-hmm. But you have to relay that to other cities where it's like trends might change or evolve through sure. the course of a tour, and you want to maintain that same type of protection and security uh, layer uh, that should be involved in every show. So this next part is kind of a two-part question. I, I want to know, like, how many people do you have underneath you at a time? And then going into that, like, you're, you're the lead security for Shinedown and Motley Crue and Nickelback. What happens if the two have concerts going on at the same time, but they're not together? So I have a full team. Um, I've got people on uh, Morgan Wallen. I've got people on Bailey Zimmerman, uh, people on Mudvayne. Uh, I got people on Nickelback. Right now, I flucked out the last year. There's no overlap. And this this year, there's no overlap because all the band the bands I primarily deal with um, are kind of writing albums and doing their thing now. But it's one of those things where part of my job is to start getting the right people in front of these guys, yeah, and, or girl artists, so they they're familiar with certain people to cover. If something were to happen, it's like not even work related. If I have to go to a funeral or um, actually no, because I take that back. I don't, if I'm working, I, I've missed three weddings the last couple of years, best man, uh, funerals. I'm, when I'm working, I'm so locked into what I do. I can't, now obviously if I'm having a kid uh, or something personal, like family member, yeah, it's a little bit different, but yeah, that's a whole other subset in terms of like how, <laughs> how to do, like you know, like there's no days off. Right, right. Especially with if you're in the law enforcement, you have a, how many sick days a year? And you, we always laugh when I was in the, did the government. I never used sick days. I was never sick. Yeah. My sick days were I need two days to get the fuck away from DC. Right. And we're going to tear up Baltimore for right. a while. And, and um, the yeah. mental health day, yeah. Correct. I need to get away because if you're not going to give it to me, um, but I don't have those days when you're working like that. So I have a good team around underneath me and around me that I work with and uh, that are very uh, – we, we just all finished our in-service training, which is uh, all our D cards, D cards, like guards and licenses, CCW stuff, our shooting we have to do every year. Um, I just became like – this crazy chlor. I can send you a link. It's wild. But to become, to become an international firearm specialist, it's this ATF-based class. It literally took me two weeks. But everything from handguns, pistols, to explosive, to laws, and courtroom, and like just evidence and ammunition, like just extensive. And I just took it because I was bored. But it's a three-year thing that lasts for three years. You get this really cool diploma and badge with it. And so it's like... All that type of trade, you have to stay on top of this stuff. Like, just yeah. because I'm not actively in a uh, law enforcement troop, I still have to maintain, at least if you want to be at my level, there's laws and stuff change every year. Yeah. And so 
you have to know, hey, if I carry my pistol, I got to be careful because D.C. has different gun laws in Wisconsin or Virginia and Maryland or New York City or Boston. So it's like you have to be at the up and up because you see a lot of these stories of bodyguards that, of these R&B artists and like mm-hmm. these pop singers that just get carrying their ammo, get arrested at nightclub. It's like you're just a goon. Yeah. There's a lot more to this than just being able to say you can carry a gun. Well, and it's the same it, – uh, uh... Sorry, so uh, a good cop is better than an untrained cop, and an untrained yeah. cop is better than a bad cop. We, you know, we don't need bad cops out there. We don't need Correct. bad security guards out there. Correct. Um, okay, so you mentioned what what does John carry when he's when he's working as an event? If you feel comfortable again. Um. Yeah, I mean, if I always have access to like a shotgun. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say where that is, or, <laughs> um, but. It's one of the th- interesting things is I usually don't carry a sidearm um, when I'm working in a crowd or like a festival or like a, and the only reason is sometimes my artists go into the crowd. Yeah. And so once you go out there, the liability of carrying that firearm, yes, I, it's one thing I can, can keep it concealed and mm-hmm. against my body and I'm not going to blade my body like I look like I'm about to uh, whatever. And so... But once, if I'm out there watching a guy or a singer or a guitar player out there twirling around with a crowd, I can't worry about some drunk guy grabbing me by accident. Or right. You see these videos where some people go into a crowd and off-duty cop has been drinking and starts doing flips and jumps and partying. Yeah. Pulls a gun out or falls out. He picks up and pulls the trigger and shoots someone. Yep. It's not worth that liability. And I trust the people that are doing the security checks at the doors to check for weapons like that. Um but again, I've been in situations where my singer and I have gone to a crowd when fights have broken out. And I posted this video recently where I, we did this show in Rock AM Rig. Rock AM, yeah, Rock AM Rig in Germany. Huge metal festival, 50,000, 60,000 people. We literally went down the middle of this crowd of 50,000 people, and this wall of death happens. And him and I, Brent and I, are just literally laser focused, walking from the front of the house right to stage, like throwing people around. It's, it's just pure chaos. But like those moments, it's like imagine if you had a fire up there and you fell, or yeah. and your guns out, and then people are screaming. It's like it's not worth it. Well, even if they're, you're if not, the, it, you're not going to pull a gun out in a crowd anyway. Right. You, you, you've got stupid. way too many points of that you have to be cognizant of besides the person. You don't you're know where at. the su- yeah. you're, where you're aiming in a safe direction. There's no warning shots. Right. Uh, there's uh, you don't know what's going to be behind your line of sight. Like all all this stuff where you're just like. Now, when you go personal and kind of do like some like day off type stuff, you can get more discreet because you always dress up and you have a suit jacket. You can be more. Yeah. You're not going to be an active like Applebee's mosh pit. <laughs> what? Uh, so when you've got one of your your teams going off with another band that you're not going to be there, what is John looking for in leadership for that team? Yeah, it's fuck. It's a great question. Uh, represent the brand. And the brand for me. If I'm out there working, not only do I represent my, my last name and who I am, but the company, but I also represent the artist. I represent the lighting company of the artist, the sound company of the artist. Like, you, you represent this whole thing. I represent the fan base of this artist. And so it's like, if you are an asshole or a dick, you're just a, a prick. Like, you're just not helpful. You're just, you, I don't want to be associated with you. It's like, people don't want that or but they don't want to be represented by that and so for me it's like always look the part if you're gonna play hard on a night off or day off play hard but if you're gonna when it's time to work work hard too if you're gonna soar with the eagles at night you better roost with the crows in the morning yeah and so uh you have to just look the part be clean cut be professional don't be it's t- it, I worry about that stuff because I would hit a call at 4 a.m. saying, hey, something happened. And like you, it's like you don't – whether it's on duty or off duty, you don't want that call to come in. And say, hey, right. something happened at a bar because someone was talking shit and your partner punched someone out. And now there's a – so it's like stuff like that where you're kind of like, well, hold – so take a deep breath. You want thinkers. You want people to quick on their feet. And we're not – I mean, we're not saving lives either. Yeah. So it's like just be a good human. Be a decent human. Uh, be professional and be strict. And I, people respect me because I'm not that, I'm the person I'm describing. 
mm-hmm. where they fear what I could become if you make me act that way. Yeah. Whereas I came, if I was always punching first and grabbing people, people look at you going, dude, you're an animal. You have no control over yourself. And I don't know how many times I've been called a bitch or spat on or swung out where I'm just like, I just laugh. It's like you laugh about like the roadhouse yeah. where it's like be, be cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah, be nice. But it's like you have to. If, you re- if, you, if a guy, you pull some guy over and he's like, fuck you pigs and saying all this stuff. It's like my first thought when I was a cop through training, I'm going to beat the shit out of this guy. But you like, you can't. It's yeah. like the restraint to do your job in the face of adversity like that. That's what makes a good leader. That's what makes a good worker. So you're in charge. Or you're the lead security for these bands. You are their protection. They have to rely on you. What did, was there like a trial period or was it just, man, we're on the road every night and you guys eventually had that like cohesion together? What was that like building that relationship? Yeah, it's like you, they got to feel you out. I mean, obviously, when you first work with a band, they know your background and they know you're the real deal. But Sometimes that doesn't work out because you don't get like the uh, the rapport. I think that's what the uh, all the law people say these days. Uh, <laughs> you have to you actually have to establish that rapport um, where their families trust you and their kids trust you. And I've been fortunate enough to have that every band I've worked with. And so it's if they see you put the work in and care about the craft and take not only care of them but the crew and the fans. And this isn't. Like, you can make mistakes. Um, failure isn't a, a bad thing. A simple, now, if you are, like, I, I, maybe failure is not the right term. Like, there's a lot of times in my career where I've had learning experiences where so maybe if I did that with an egress route, blow out barricade, or that could maybe be better. Stuff like that where you kind of quarterback yourself. But as long as you are trying to do the right thing, and you, again, if something happens at the front of the house, with arms, this issue with the gates, people back checking, they're not you. Right. They're not, they don't know, they're $9 an hour. They don't, yeah. this is just a paycheck. And so I have to still have to answer for those people's actions. Yeah. And so I, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's, such, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rush because you don't know. I've, I've been involved, with, I remember uh, one show at the Webley Arena. Uh, with uh, Nickelback, we had a bomb threat under the subway and we had to evacuate. We woke up on our buses there. I had to pull the guys off the bus. We had to shelter in place in the venue. And it was right by the ferry, by the London Eye, and then the, the metro, by the mall, underneath the uh, arena there. And it was an active bomb threat. We had to evacuate, hold doors. And that was the first time where I'm like, I had to call my boss, Chris, and be like, hey, I just want to make sure I'm doing this right because you read about this stuff and train about it, but it's like when there's actual lives at stake and money involved and hey, with it's like people realize a lot of this stuff, early, late doors or like there's a lot of money involved in terms of putting on a show like this. Now, obviously, if it's a safety issue that that takes precedent, but there's a lot that goes into this stuff when it comes to holding doors or evacuating what it takes to get people back in the venue if it's a faulty fire alarm type stuff. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, there's been times where I've been out there and people got nosy dealing with crazy stalkers, uh, death threats. I got one earlier today. Uh, really? On Instagram with uh, myself and the bass player for Shinedown. We had this long run in with this kid. He's up in Ontario and he's just, he's off his medication. I, we don't think he's a bad kid. We've done enough digging on him with law enforcement where it's just, he's just, he hears voices in his head. Um, and we always keep eyes on him. We know where he's at at all times up there. But this morning, he creates a new Instagram handle and messages Eric and I. I was like, hey. It starts posting pictures of me going, I know who you are. If you don't fucking tell Shine down there, the devil, I'm coming to get you. You better bow down to me before I kill you. And I, I mean, I laugh because I'm like, dude, bring it. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just like, it's, it's just unfortunate you get kind of wrapped into that because there are people out there like that that, that maybe act upon that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that stuff happens all the time. Uh, Nikki Six has been very active uh, talking about those two stalkers he's been dealing with in his house where people try to get his property and break in his house. And it's like this court order, they're not listening. Those people that are malicious and have ill intent, they're not going to, they don't care about a stay away order or a restraining order. It's no like content, that's just yeah. a waste of, that's a waste, and you know that, it's a waste of time and paperwork. Right. Yep. Yes, it's part of the process, but 
what happens when that next they say screw it and they pull a gun out and kill someone right so right yeah it's it's, it's quite the industry so been doing it since 2012 been around the world a bunch of times you decided at one point let's get behind the mic and let's start doing a podcast what brought that on so that was stemmed from when the pandemic first hit one of the reasons why i love what i do traveling i get to network and see my friends in different industries and obviously a lot of people i hang out with in different towns were the former military people i met law enforcement all like the i get you would say like for me like the alpha personality type people i resonated with um Go shooting, just hang out, talk the shit, just ride around, drive around with them and their cruisers. Um, but I felt like the pandemic, again, I, before this, I wasn't watching the news anyway. So yeah. I didn't want to be infiltrated with people telling me what to do or how to think. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, if I, I might miss the human interaction of talking to people. Um, so why not start a podcast to kind of keep that going alive. So it basically allowed me to not only pick up my love of reading again, like reading all these books from authors or uh, former guys who infiltrated the Hell's Angels and like all this different stuff with law enforcement. Then I went to that. Then I went to like all this movie stuff and artist stuff and anything that kind of shaped my career. I go down these rabbit holes and learn about this stuff. And it was like, it just allowed me to have really good time to talk and have fun. And it's like, there's no agenda per se. It's just, no one's right. No one's wrong. I mean, none of my guests have said they're an expert, which I love because everyone's always learning. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the podcast stuff, man, like it's just fun talking to different people. It's like, you don't know for me, I've had more people reach out and be like, Hey, I heard your podcast or someone's on the podcast. Have you checked out this podcast? And then I'll go and look at this other person's podcast. It kind of started around the same time and be like, Holy shit. Cause as you know, the amount of work that goes into this yeah. to main, to maintain this level of podcast and just think of the people you know that start when you start yours mm-hmm. about 90 percent of them probably stopped yeah and like yeah. here we are life kids sick family members actual work other hobbies we do social life and you still maintain this level of it's like, like a really good balance for me like it just allows me to kind of reset myself with different topics reading and just getting to talk to people it's it's fucking rad well and like and I think there's been one guest that I've had where it happened on the day that we planned at the time that we planned life happens, like you said, so stuff is always changing. Um, so like you've had I mean, the whole gamut, you've had law enforcement, you've had people that have infiltrated the mob, you've had actors and authors and, and band artists. How do you obtain these people to come on your show? Is it just because of the connections you have or is it you're throwing? Yeah, an email I out mean, there? I, I think for me, it's, and I can get, a lot of people have asked me to have more singers and bands on there. The reason why I don't, I could have anyone out there right now if I wanted. Yeah. Um, I just, I live in that world. So I'm kind of like, I don't want to talk. I talk to these people in catering. I don't want to talk to them. <laughs> um, but with that being said, I started a podcast with Eric from Shine Down. Um, that's just us talking about random stuff. I have another podcast with Zach from Shine Down. It's just bizarre and over the top, dark humor. <laughs> but for me, it's just like, in my industry, it's people know who you are. The, the word gets out. It's just like, so they kind of, they know who you are. That if I want to talk to certain people in the entertainment world. Um, and then it, again, f- my first couple of guests were very law enforcement or people I knew or like a connection away from the yeah. introduction, super easy. But now it's like, I have to turn down. I have PR groups and stuff. Hey, my artist or my author or my client just invented some new solar panel thing, or he's working on this new vaccine stuff. It's like, I like to pick and choose who I talk to just because my schedule is so, once I'm on the road, I really don't do this. I, yeah. That's why I have to stockpile episodes. Um, but yeah, it's just, once you get out there, and then once you build up your body of work with episodes, it's readily available for people to hear or watch. And so other guests where, I've never reached out to a guest and they never said no to me. Now, part of that is I'm not reaching out to the crazy level guests yet, but like, but someone like me, like I'm, I'm going to have Chuck Norris out here. Yeah, I'm going to have Stallone. I'm going to have my top tier people. I think would be cool. Like I would love to have on here, um, but I don't. I like this the organic slow build of it. Yeah, and there's no. 
the worst thing someone's gonna say to you is no. Right. And there, I, I take that there was one time I reached out to a guest, and sh- I'm not gonna. Uh, basically, she's a legend in the horror world from like the 70s, 80s. Like, okay. awesome. And I reached out, and her. I was doing this crazy week of like all horror guests, Kate Hodder, all that stuff. And so I reach out to her PR, do th- I go through the proper channels. And so I, her PR is like, well, it's just like, just not big enough. Like, you're not big enough yet. You're kind of, it's busy schedule, busy season because it's October, which I get because those horror people are swamped in the fall for obvious reasons. And so I, uh, yeah, I go, you know what? Cool, cool. <clears throat> Couple months later, a friend of that person was like, hey, how come you don't have him on? I go, well, I went through a chain of command. He put me direct with this person. I do it. Awesome interview. The person's like, man, I wish, let me know when I do part two, part three. I'll share more stories. <clears throat> I get it all polished up, launch the episode. I send the clip, the write up, and all the artwork to the PR person. I'm like, hey, just so you know, if get a pulse, better pulse on your clients because they're missing really good opportunities. Yeah. And I sent a screenshot of the last three podcasts these people are on, I had 25,000 more views of this person after a week. Ooh. And all these established blue check mark fucking things, I go, and they wrote back to me like, hey, I apologize. Here's a list of my other clients. <laughs> and I'm like, no, what? I, don't, I don't need you. Yeah. And that's the only time where I felt like I had to like peacock a little bit. Like, you know what, motherfucker? I might be small now, but how you handle that situation, you're only going to fire me up. Right. I'm right. bigger than your client. All your clients right now, individually, my brand is bigger than them. Yeah. Maybe not as big as them when they're in the 80s or 90s or whatever, but right now, they need me more than I need them. And I, ha- I kind of keep that edge to me where it's like, I, we put, I put in so much work to this, and you put a lot of work into planning, organizing, research. And it's for some PR person, some person to kind of just be like, you know what, you're not worth my time. Anyone, anyone listening to this, the minute someone says... You don't know, like you don't know who's listening to this. It could be like, fuck, I want to be a podcaster. I want to be a cop. Or the effect being on anyone else's podcast has could be extra mentally powerful for anyone listening. And it's like I don't think people realize the rapid chain, the chain reaction that could kick off with podcasting. And it's like when I talk to people, and I've I've done done a lot of people people's podcasts before, and I'm just like I they'll ask me questions like, how do you do this or that? It's like it's a full time job. Yeah. It's I literally live and breathe this when I can. And it's about as long as you give a shit about what you're doing and what you're saying and believing, the rest will fall into place. I did, my first six, seven months, oh, a couple of views here and there. Once I finally hit my stride, now it's like it's fucking fire. It's yeah. like everyone will finally get there. It's the people that, that give up. They're never going to reach that point. It is, and you have those bad days where it's like you, you can't get guests to confirm and like – you got work this week. You try to schedule stuff this week and stuff falls through. You're kind of like, take a step back and be like, you know what? What's meant to be is meant to be. I'm gonna, what I can do, I'm going to do my best so I can get this working. And just believe in your product. And that's why, for me, Spear Talk has been fucking rad, rad as fuck. Yeah, I think like if – so like the first time we had to reschedule, if that had happened year one, I would have been super bummed out. But like year three, I understand. It's all part of it. Like we, like you said, lies, yeah, that's work, a, that, and that's the problem with me, and I apologize for that because it's like no, 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 if no, no, I no, wasn't no. – if I wasn't podcasting myself, uh, it, I would do every I do every process every day of the hour. Like I yeah. love it. Um, it's just with my work schedule sometimes. When I think I'm gonna be home, which I'll get like a hey, there's this Grammy party you have to do, or this this thing you have to be this weekend, you have to go out and do it. So I'm like whatever, it's work. I gotta do it. So it's one of those things where it's like getting me to like do a podcast. Once I commit to it, I commit to it. So I yeah. again, I thank you for. Allowed me to juggle around times Absolutely. for you. Absolutely. You talk about the the, the 80s horror star. Uh, star. It kind of reminds me of it, like the pro wrestlers from the 80s and 90s who now they're relying on those autograph sessions because they're living yeah. off their name back then. But do you have any examples or times where it was like, don't meet your hero or confirming, hey, this person's an awesome person? Uh, is this like in person or like podcasting? Just in general? It, just in general. I guess podcasting would be... Um. Again, I've reached out to people I've wanted to talk to. I do enough research or I know enough about them where I'm a pretty good judge of character. If this person's been established to be an asshole, I might not 
judge them uh, per se. Uh, I might not have them on there too because I don't want to. I never want. I let the thing with me. I let the guests talk. Like I'm a very active listener, very much like you are. And so it's like I let them. They're the reason why people are tuning in or most likely tuning in or whatever. And so I I like them to be like, hey, the talk. And so if I have a mis or a preconceived notion that this possible guest is a hothead or late or just talk shit or gets political or just it's just a prick, I'm not going to talk to him. It might be an actor I love. Yeah. Which has happened where I'm like, I wish I could talk to this person, but it's like I can't have a conductive discussion with this person because I don't want to go down a rabbit hole or say something. Um, you know, I'll talk about this guest. Uh, he passed away two years ago. Bob Wall. He was O'Hara in Enter the Dragon. Okay. Martial artist. Uh, he was a guy that had the scar. If anyone don't see the movies, he had the scar. He was the right hand henchman uh, for the main bad guy, and he fights Bruce Lee. And he's, his legacy. He's he's the real deal in terms of martial arts and like that community. But like, as he got older, he got like cranky and like very bombastic. But I love Enter the Dragon. It's like one of my favorite martial arts movies. But like, he's one of the last few people outside of Kung Lee or outside of, uh, can't think of the actor's name, but still alive um, from that movie. And so I set, get set up. And this is like, this is one of my maybe top 15 episodes or one of my the first 15. And he's, he's like, I can't fucking get this working. This link sucks. Meanwhile, he's on the link. I can hear him talking. He's like, Talking shit, he goes, fuck this. These podcasts are a joke. I go, listen, Bob, you're not doing <laughs> shit right now. We don't have to do this, but I put my time in. I schedule this. Like, let's do this. Like, I don't give a, you're not going to, I don't give a fuck who you are. And I gave her a back to him because I was so pissed. He's like, well, give me a second. He logs off. Five minutes later, he logs back in, apologizes. He goes, I'm just having one of these days. I'm sorry. But that split second, I had heard from other people and seen other clips or other martial artists would be like, he's kind of that guy. Yeah. But I was like, myself, for selfish reasons, while I didn't want to put myself in a situation to get shitty with him, luckily I did it off camera. Yeah. Well, I actually have it. I had that bit recorded. I just never le released it. <laughs> um, and, but I, I just love the movie so much. I'm like, well, I got to do this because he's one of the last living members of this. The anniversary is the 50th anniversary is coming up. So, yeah, it was like one time where I got super heated with a guest. And like, it's like, he wasn't a hero of mine, but it was like, it represented a movie that my youth was just still to this day. I love that movie. And so, yeah. um, but again, when it comes to world leaders or like actors and people, I talk show people, I think they're all, they've all got good and bad days, all humans. Um, I actively, I don't actively, uh, one of the coolest people I met at the White House, Chris Christopherson, uh, just amazing. And like, I'm a huge Blade fan. So his, his portrayal of Whistler. Yeah. Um, which is Blade's mentor, the weapons guy. Um, and then growing up in the highway band with Johnny Cash and, uh, and that band there uh, with Merle and Willie Nelson. And uh, so getting to talk to him coming through the White House where it's like he was like the most coolest. And so he walked by me and I'm like, oh, what's up, Whistler? And like it caught off guard because obviously when you're walking into a White House, you're not thinking someone's a name drop, a character you played in Blade. And, but he turned around and he goes, hey, what's up? I go, Mr. Christopherson, like, I just want to say, like, I meet a lot of people, but, like, you growing up and, like, still to this day, you're such a cool person. And then we talked about how he stood and helped deflect uh, for Sinead O'Connor when she was booed uh, that one time at uh, Madison Square Garden. Her documentary is amazing, by the way, if you want to check it out. But how he was able to, like, tell his crowd, hey, stop booing her. Like, we just had to talk for, like, 15 minutes. He's going to some gala with Obama. Like, all these people are there. Seals walking by. Jay-Z. All these people walking by. And I'm just talking to him about just a normal dude. Like, he's one of the coolest interactions I've ever had. But it's one of those things where it's like you roll the dice. In that moment, he could have been like, what the f What? Who the fuck are you? Yeah. It could have been like, talk to me. Maybe said, hey, this guy, he can't be talking but you know what? I was like, well, dude, that's Whistler, dude. <laughs> I think I think you have two T-shirts sitting right there. One is "Listen, Bob," and, and the other one's "Hey, Whistler." But yeah. <laughs> before I ask you one of my last questions, I, I think just kind of getting the vibe from your show and from this this episode right now, I think you're kind of like me, a little bit of a nerd, right? 
Yeah, so I my, loved, love it. My question, total hypothetical, who would win in a fight to the death, Voldemort or a Secret Service member? <clears throat> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> How I, I don't like if you're asking me how I would have dealt with Voldemort, like I don't know how you combat magic. I'm a very, uh, I have my my faith and mm-hmm. my Christianity and stuff, yeah, where I think that would help me. God, I don't know, like it'd be interesting because it's like he's like a supernatural being, so it's like right. I don't know how you would deal with. I don't know if I get enough shots off enough time without him blocking or casting some spell. <laughs> I, it'd be it'd be such an interesting. It it'd be like what? Well, I guess for you, like when it comes to like law enforcement, if you had to arrest, or if you had to be a partner, like who would you rather have your partner as your partner, Axel Foley or Nick Nolte in Forty Eight Hours? Oh, like who's a better partner? I uh, probably Axel Foley, just because he's easier to get along with and he gets the job done at the end of the day, and right. it's a little bit off the cuff, and you had a headache. But I, yeah, probably Axel Foley. I think would be who I would yeah. go with anyway. Um, and I probably should have given the backstory before I asked that question. I posed that question in a different light on a, another thing that I'm doing, where it was, would a, a SWAT boy with whatever gear he wanted win, or would it be Voldemort? And the, the thought process being there, like, if I've got my shield, can can Avada Kedavra go through the shield? So, total nerd yeah, moment, I, mean, I know. but Yeah, I mean, if I, if I was Voldemort, I'd, I'd fuck. You'd make the ground disappear. <laughs> like, That'd be such an interesting thing. Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see a character like that, like obviously establish a new like, uh, jo- like a new like franchise, but yeah. like how magic would work in like a situation like that. Yeah. All right. Could you it- imagine getting a call to a, like a crime scene where it's like, "Hey, we got a guy out here. Uh, we he's casting spells." <laughs> And you roll up there, you're like, what the hell? Well, the first thing I would think is that it was a meth head, obviously. Like- <laughs> yeah, PCP, yeah. <laughs> and then I would get there and be like, all right, I'm 10 8, I'm, uh, I'm off duty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Call him the laughs> <next> mes- <laughs> yeah, sick day. All right, back, back on topic here now that we've taken a little swerve. Um, this show's about leadership and mental health, obviously, and, and you're with a couple of bands that really care about mental health. What is, yeah, like, your, your life is so up and down. What does mental health look like for you? How do how do you recharge, reboot, you know, kind of stay on the level? Uh, so for me on the road, I bring my camera out with me. It's so on days off, definitely in like Europe, like outside the United States, um, just because historically there's so much more to do with Berlin than uh, New Jersey. Uh, so like I love old architecture, cemeteries, history like that. So my camera acts kind of as I get to walk around, fresh air, Explore, learn, take pictures. It kind of resets myself between every show. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, when I first started doing that, people were kind of like, normally, I don't, I know we still do this, but we'd find a day at a pub somewhere and just hang out and just let loose a little bit. But once I started doing this other stuff, I had band members or other crew people. We'd have like this posse now that, hey, when John drops his bags in the hotel, we get off the bus, like we're going out, like shower, and we're headed, bring your cameras. And so it's like a cool, like, cleanse to, like, the mind where it's like you're doing something, you're appreciating the moment, you're capturing it, it's quiet. Like, you don't have to talk with your, in our group. We just kind of do our thing and just walk around the cities. Reading lately has been a uh, – read. I would say reading and, like, my faith has been a, a better – almost kind of kept me more together in my, in my head where it's like I don't have to solve all these problems alone. Um, and whether you believe in a religion or not or a God, like more power to you whether you decide. But for me, it's like there's that inner conscience, like that kind of guardian angel type atmosphere like I ask questions to and talk to at night. Uh, but like, I don't, like you said, there's some really long days. I've had, I've been on tours where people have died and crew members have OD'd or committed suicide and that stuff weighs on you. When yeah. the pandemic hit, I lost a lot of people to alcoholism and suicide and opiate addiction. And it's like a uh, lot of artist friends, a lot of rock and roll artist friends. And so you kind of find out how vital it is to have those quiet moments to kind of step away. And it's a very, in my industry, it's perceived as very masculine. Yes, there's a lot of females that do certain jobs as well, but... Like, hold your feelings. It's rock and roll, baby. Like, that is the, the lamest, most stupid. That might have worked in the 70s, 80s, 90s. 
But to say, oh, it's rock and roll, let's get to it, like, it's okay to have a bad day. Yeah. And just admitting that would help alleviate a lot of the issues. Sometimes when I'm having a bad day, like, I'm in a weird spot because I can't, and like you, your reaction or actions dictate the lives of people. And it's like, I can't bring an issue from home to my shift at work because it's like, I, it's just going to get in the way. I'd have to step away. And that's not fair to the client, so or fair to the people, the city, the town you represent. Uh, but yeah, it's just, uh, I think you just have to acknowledge if you're having a bad day, just f- figure out which helps you best, whether it's going for a walk, taking pictures, going to the movies, going shopping, grabbing a bowl of ice cream and just watching your favorite movie. Like, I don't, it's so easy to just put a rope around your neck or take pills. I mean, for, I, this is just me saying this, where, to get to that point where you feel, where you, where you feel it's easier to pull a trigger, and like it's tough enough when you're aiming down sight and potentially have to pull a trigger on a suspect or a person, let alone your own head. And it's like for me to get once you see people or hear about people to get to that point and go through with it, like fuck, man, like how do you even, how do you even reach out? It's like I've had friends that I've never been suicidal, uh, never had the urge. I don't even know if I understand it. Maybe that's part of the problem. Uh, for me, I'm never depressed. At least I don't think I am. Um, yeah, sure, I have bad days, but my friends that have bad days or are depressed or have suicidal thoughts, I'm like, their biggest thing for them has been realizing they can reach out and call randomly, FaceTime, talk, pull someone aside my hand, I need to talk to you, I had some bad thoughts last night, and just hear them talk about it and talk them through it. Yeah. Um, I think recently, Alan Richardson, who plays, uh, he's the lead actor in Jack Reacher, on Amazon, the TV show, the main, the main guy, yeah, yeah. the big brooding yeah. dude, he was on a podcast where years, a couple of years ago, before he broke it big, he hung himself with a green extension cord yep. in his office or some studio, and the, the cord broke. And it was his wake-up call to t- ask for help, get help, and seek like assistance from other people and just talk through these problems. Like It was his sign that, hey, it's not my time to go. And I just thought that was... We're getting to the age now where you look at something like that. If that was liking it to maybe a Stallone or a John claude Van Damme or Arnold back in the 80s or 90s for us, yeah. they might have had those thoughts. We don't know about that yet. But had if someone in that era come out and said, and this, this is Chuck Norris, he, he, he was almost suicidal because he was depressed. It's like you'd be like, holy fuck, how many lives that would have saved yeah. if the masculine, if people actually act- actively talked about that stuff? Because it was obviously happening. Yeah. This isn't a new trend, or I just think now it's just more prevalent with social media and fucking bullies and assholes and stuff. So a little bit of glorifying yeah. it as well, but yes, we, you know we also talk about how many times did an officer die from cleaning their gun, whereas it was yeah. something else. Yeah, so we definitely have to open that up and we have to start talking about that and being you know real about it because there is an issue right now, like you said, just with the media constantly putting it out there. We need to find a way to combat that. But yeah. It's very interesting to see how you guys deal with it and how you deal with it being on the road, not having, you know, like if I have an issue here centered where I'm at, I can go find a therapist, but you're constantly on the yeah, road. It's, yeah, it's on you. Your therapy is your, your band, like the people you're closest with. Like when I was in the Secret Service, we had this program, uh, I think of the Ombudsman. Okay. Basically, like they're kind of like, hey, if you need to talk to someone, go and sit down. And, and it's like I never trusted them because it was just felt so like, it was from the. It was part of the program. It was the same people that are going to be answering to your bosses, or like, it's, it wasn't an outside entity. There was like no, and again, I know it's cliche to say safe space, but if you said what you're really thinking, the next call is your supervisor right. going, "Hey, we're going to pull you off this. We're going to take your gun. We're going to do this because." I was like, "Hold on a second. I'm just. Where's the safety in me talking? Where I can talk to anyone on the road." <laughs> tour people and my office people and be like, Hey, I'm going through this and like literally solve the problem or figure out what's going on and talk through it where the governmental, and the law, like that's up to do what makes no sense for us. It's the EAP. It's the employee assistance oh, yeah. program. Yeah. So, and I think it's, it somewhat has gotten better in, in certain places, but a lot of that, I don't want to call it trial and error because there's, it's worse than that, but yeah, it was, reaching out for help and then doing all the wrong things as opposed to getting a person on the right step. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Um, so closing this out, tell everyone how they can find. I mean, I, you're obviously very, very big, but like you've got everything from a book club going on to coffee to merch to the show. How can people find you, and what can they look forward to with you? Uh, so the podcast is called Spear Talk. Uh, it's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, Pandora, all that podcast streaming bullshit. Uh, best thing to find it is just type in a little search engine, Spear Talk, S-P-E-A-R Talk. It'll pop right up. Um, yeah, that, that's out there everywhere. And then for my personal uh, Instagram is at John Silverspear, uh, which that information is all like when you click like the episode links, you'll know like where to find me and stuff. But my emails, John at Silverspear, security.com, and I get emails all the time from possible guests who are just fans of the show or people that just want to talk and stuff. And so the coffee and, like, all the merch stuff, it's all – all the links are on the social media. Just go to speartalkpodcast.com. Uh, that's the store. And I'm in the process right now of launching, like, a big website that's going to house everything. Uh, and I'm la- I just launched uh, two new podcasts on my channel. So I'm kind of creating like a Spear Talk channel where other different type of podcast subsets get to do their thing. One coming on just about writing between writers and musicians. And then one is just me and Eric talking about life, history, science, creativity. Another one's more women's empowerment and social, uh, s- social studies and uh, mental health. So I'm kind of creating like this kind of network where it's like a one-stop shop for all things uh, like podcasting. Like, still to this day, some people are so confused. Like when I like every, I, maybe you have the experience where when I advertise, hey, a new episodes premiering tonight or tomorrow, people will be like, I'm I'm working, I'm gonna miss it. That sucks. I wish I could see it. Well, it's premiering. <laughs> it's gonna be on YouTube or Spotify. You go back and watch it ten years from now. Yeah. So it's like getting the information out to people. You could never assume that someone knows what you're talking about. So it's like an audience. You might have people that don't know what the Gears podcast is because they're the, you're not active on Twitter or, say, Facebook. They're only, they're only active on Instagram or yeah. vice versa. It's like your audience has to have access to you. That's fine for me. I'm like, fuck, I only want to do YouTube. I didn't care about anything else, but it's like now you have to do Facebook Reels. YouTube Reels, Instagram, uh, and then focus on the, the streaming stuff for podcasts like yeah. the Pandora and Spotify. It's again, it's a full time job, but it's like I, I want to make sure anyone in my audience has every opportunity they can to take in an episode or learn something. So um, if it's a new thing that's coming or a new, I'm probably gonna be on it. Uh, threads, I'm, I still don't understand what that is, but it's. <laughs> You, you got to play the game, right? Like you might not, you might have a fan that only knows what Threads is, and yeah. it's like, God damn it, yeah. I got to post on here now. Right. It's and there's no link to connect it all together. It's got to be no. It's like, open this app, Instagram close that page. One. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So stupid. I I just I cannot suggest going over and checking out Spear Talk enough. It's there's no way that there isn't something he's done that will interest you because it has covered literally everything. I mean, he's very much like Rogan. Maybe not on the Rogan level yet, but I think you're going to get there very, very soon because it's like it's like you're living the rock star life from the backside of it, the backstage side of it. So it's very, very cool. Yeah, it's it's such a weird thing because it's like I, if this was my full time job, if I like I can I can only imagine in my head I know where this would be if this was my actual career. But like you said, I actually am actively working. I'm writing out. I'm writing two books. Um, I'm working on a photography book. I'm doing all this other stuff too. Where I'm like, I got a comic book coming. Nice. A story I wrote in the pandemic. It's about like this uh, World War II tank platoon that encounters a werewolf, and so it's becoming a real comic book. Yeah. That the, the illustrator from Marvel is going to do, and so it's like all these things I got in this pot. So it's like, I love it because it keeps me sane. It keeps me hyper focused when I can on each individual thing. But I, kudos to people like Joe Rogan who dedicate their craft to that. Yeah. Now, obviously, he's a comedian as well. Uh, does that for his job, but yeah, man, it's, it's fascinating. Do you have any other parting words, any other words of wisdom before we sign off here? No, man, I think, I think people just need to get out there and learn something new every day, appreciate life, laugh, um, and don't take, don't take what you have each day for granted. You might lose the ability to walk tomorrow. You might 
not be here tomorrow. You might uh, lose the ability to speak or hear or touch or taste. And it's like take advantage of all those experiences you have right this moment because tomorrow it could all be gone. So, Well, John, you've been an awesome guest. I loved having you on. It's been an awesome hour plus. Um, like I said to all the everyone listening, please go over to Spirit Talk Podcast or SpiritTalk.com and check out all the stuff that he's got going on. Um, you can always go over to web- our website and contact us. This one here was a listener suggestion, a listener, a listener request, so we're looking to do more of that. Uh, go over and contact us, and we'll see what we can do. But otherwise, stay safe, and we will get through this together. Awesome.